is the just read uh, <clears throat> I too will go ahead and read the gospel for the day and what it's going for the Monday of Holy Week. And here again in San Diego and this gospel in the land of St. Didicus is taken from the St. John that's okay, that's chapter 12 six days before the Pasch, Jesus came to Bethania where Lazarus had been dead whom Jesus raised to life and they made him a supper there and Martha served but Lazarus was one of them that were at table with him Mary therefore took a pound of ointment of right, of right spikenard, of great price, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, he that was about to betray him, said, Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence, three hundred denarii, and given to the poor? Now he said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And having the purse carried what was put there, but Jesus said, "Let her let her alone, that she may keep it against the day of my burial. For the poor you have always with you, but me you have not always." The great multitude therefore of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but they might that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And those are the words of today's holy God. Today we have the story of Saturday before Palm Sunday, six days before the crucifixion of Christ. And the Saint Saint John points out Saint John points out that the problem that we have on this day is that Judas says when, when, the, when Saint Mary Magdalene takes three hundred denarii, three hundred days laid wages of ointment that she had because she had lived a wicked life and she was a prostitute. She had given up that life, but she still had leftover oils, uh, uh, very expensive ointment from the from the from uh, from her life. And she went and she poured it on the feet of our Lord. And it's interesting what happened. St. John tells the familiar version of the story that we all know, and that is that Judas was upset. But yesterday we read the Gospel of St. Matthew, the Passion according to St. Matthew. We notice what about the other apostles, and that it went, and that the and the, and the other apostles they were also very upset. They were upset that the that the uh, uh, that this one this could have been what was the purpose of this waste. And when Jesus was in Bethania, says Saint Matthew about this same event we read about today in a Monday, in the house of Simon the leper, there came to him a woman who was Saint Mary Magdalene, have an alabaster box of precious ointment. And he poured it on his head and he, as he was at table. And the disciples, seeing it, plural, had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this might have been sold for much and given to the poor. And Jesus knowing it said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she hath wrought good work upon me. The poor you have always with you, but you, but me you do not always have. For she, in pouring this ointment upon my body, hath done it for my burial. And amen, I say to you, that whosoever, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, that also which she hath done shall be told for a memory of, of her. And then went one of the twelve, that was called Judas Iscariot, to the chief priests, and he said to them, What will you give me if I will deliver him unto you? Today is Saturday in the gospel. That's okay. Saturday before Palm Sunday. That we're reading about. On Saturday before Palm Sunday, we don't read the gospel that day because our focus is on Palm Sunday itself. Because the Palm Sunday, we focus on the crucifixion. Saturday before Palm Sunday, we focus on, on Palm Sunday. And then today, Monday, we are reminded of what happened two days ago, six days before Christ was crucified. And let us consider what was in the heart of what was in the mind of the disciples? There are 12 apostles. They all love Christ. They all believe in Christ. And Mary Magdalene, who they know has repented, she comes in with the appointment with, with the anointment, the ointment that came from her life as a prostitute and an expensive prostitute, 300 denarii. 
300 days wages. We're talking about, about oil, which in today's term would be somewhere around $30,000 in value. There's a $30,000 value of one bottle of ointment, and she comes in and she breaks it open, and she pours it on the feet of our Lord. She drops some of his heads to St. Matthew, and then she goes to his feet, and she blasts it on his feet, and the ointment goes over the entire room and spells the entire face. And it says, and the disciples were scandalized. This could have been sold and given to the poor. Judas, what made him special? Judas knew the precise value. Judas knew the rather the precise price. He knew it was worth 300 denarii. The other apostles knew it was just expensive. And they love Christ, and, 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 and but this is ridiculous. There's, there's got to be some limit. What is he doing? He's, he's taken this expensive ointment that could have been given to the poor, could have been used for such good, and it's being ripped, wasted, and poured on the floor. And Judas spoke out. But he was speaking what was in the heart of all the apostles. Now, let us note here concerning Judas. Many times during the course of the gospel, the St. Peter speaks out. And oftentimes when he speaks, he's the one to say the words. Lord, to whom shall we go? But he's speaking on behalf of all the apostles. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou alone has the words of eternal life. And ten apostles, they don't know how to put it in words. They don't know how to put it in words. They're afraid. But Simon Peter stands up for them and says, Lord, to whom shall we go? We don't understand why you said eat my flesh and drink my blood. We don't know why you said that. But we have nowhere else to go. Thou alone has the words of eternal life. And yes, that's what I was thinking, Simon. That's what I was thinking, Peter. We are on our hearts with St. Peter. Now it is Saturday before Palm Sunday. Where is the heart of the apostles? One of them stands up and says, To what purpose is this waste? What is the spirit is, that is in him? What is the power with which he speaks? He is speaking with the power of his master who is called Lucifer. The light bearer who is called Satanas, the enemy, who is called the devil, the one that rips apart, who is called Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. The spirit of that Satan enters into Judas, and he speaks words that could only have come from a pious man. Words that could only have come from someone that cares. There are 12 apostles, and they know Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, and she's been forgiven, and they understand that, and she's sorry, and that's good, but she still remember what she was. Now she's so close with Christ and close with the apostles, but remember what she was. She's filled with charity. She's sorry. She's good. We, she, she cried upon the feet of our Lord. That was very wonderful. But now that girl comes in, and she's got... $30,000 worth of ointment. Really expensive stuff. And she wasted upon the feet of our Lord. And Judas was not the only one that was scandalized. Just like in our age today. The day before Palm Sunday. What was the attitude of our holy apostles? They're nervous. They're afraid. They are disturbed. They're agitated. Because remember, right before they came into Jerusalem, St. Thomas was their spokesman, and he said was with all their hearts, I am going to Jerusalem. Don't go to Jerusalem. Don't go because you're going to die if you go to Jerusalem. Don't go, don't go, don't go. And they said, don't go, don't go, don't go. But then our Lord said, I'm going. You do as you wish. And St. Thomas spoke out, not St. Peter this time, and he said, let us go and let us die with him. You're right, Thomas. We agree with you. Better to go and die with Christ than to stay behind without him. And so they went, not understanding. And they went to Jerusalem. And then he cured the man that was born blind. And then he raised Lazarus from the dead. And everything changed. But even though everything changed, they thought it was kind of safe now. They were still very on edge. And now this woman comes in six days before the crucifixion. She comes in on Saturday before Palm Sunday. 
And she comes in and she pours alabaster oil upon his feet. And they say, this is too much. What our Lord Jesus Christ say multiple times in the Holy Gospel? Blessed is he that is not scandalized in me. Perhaps St. John was the one who didn't speak out. But St. Matthew says, the disciples. And then Christ says, and the Holy Ghost says, and, the, and Christ knew what was in their hearts. We often think it was only Judas who was the bad guy. It was only Judas that was scandalized. It was only Judas that was shocked. How many Judases were there on Saturday before Palm Sunday? There were at least 11. Perhaps St. John did not have that same spirit. But the others did. This is too much. This is not balanced. This is not right. This is not prudent. This is not the way Christ should act. I followed him. I'll follow him to death, says St. Peter. I'll follow him to death, says St. Thomas. I followed him out in the desert when we had no food, says St. Philip. We went out everywhere with him. And now he takes, we take, we always get these donations from the people wherever we go. And we take the donations, we hand them to Judas. He's always very careful to spend them wisely. Now he comes in with 30 grand worth of oil, blasts it on the floor, and he doesn't have a problem with it. This is insane. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. Do you know that was the argument that went on in heaven 4,004 years before Christ was born? 4,035 years before that day? 37 years? 4,037 years before that day, there was an argument in heaven. And the argument was, we love God. We adore God. We see the beautiful world that he's made. How wonderful we angels are. But he's going to become man. That makes no sense. He's going to make a woman his mother. He's going to have her be a queen. And we're going to have to serve her. That makes no sense. What a waste of divinity. What a waste of something of so much price. And Bishop Sheen says, Judas knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. For he knew that that ointment was worth 300 denarii. That's about 10 times what our Lord was worth. He was worth 30 pieces of silver. Whereas that ointment was worth 300. That's worth a lot. And that 300 went upon the floor. And St. Matthew tells us that was when Judas said, This is it. This is the straw that broke the camel's back. I've had enough. I can't take it anymore. Did Judas leave because he didn't believe Jesus was God? Did Judas believe because he was a heretic? Did he leave because he thought that Christ was being evil to the poor? He was scandalized at this behavior of Christ. He was shocked. If he really is Christ, if he really is the Messiah, he wouldn't act like that. I'm leaving the church because the priest was mean to me. I'm leaving the church because of all the wicked priests and bishops that are out there. I'm leaving the church because I don't, can't believe that all the money that the church is wasting on these massive cathedrals, these beautiful cathedrals, these golden chalices, when they could have sold that and given it to the poor. And we have a church that loves poverty since Vatican II. Let's make disgusting vestments. Let's make disgusting churches, and let's give to the poor. Well, have they given to the poor? They're more poor now than they ever have been. What have they thought about the poor? Do they really love the poor? And the Holy Ghost tells us in the Gospel of yesterday, in the Passion of Sorting the St. Matthew, on this same subject today, and he was a thief, or actually not, 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 it's today, St. John that says it. And he said this because he was a thief. And he had control of the purse. Look at that 300 denarii. That's 30,000 bucks. I can get a pretty penny for that. And these other apostles, they know it's valuable, but they don't know how valuable it is. They think it's worth maybe 1,000 bucks. They don't know what it's really worth. They know it's expensive. So they won't notice if 29 grand is missing. I'll take 1,000 and give it to the poor. I'll take the other 29 and keep it myself. You know what? And I'll give a thousand to the poor. They've got to be grateful because we never had that amount of money for the last several months. 
The poor will be happy because they get a thousand bucks. I'll be happy because I get twenty nine thousand bucks. And the apostles won't know any better because they know that I distributed to the poor my great generosity like I always do. This is a really good deal. Bang. She just broke it open. And his heart is scandalized. And he is filled with righteousness. Understand this. As we enter a battle, right now we're entering a battle. We learn here from the lady in the house that the neighbor is very righteous. Very righteous. You can't go shopping because it's not safe. You might get the virus that nobody has. You can't get the virus. One of our parishioners in Canada, girl went out in the backyard. Get back in the house! And now they're going to extend social distancing to the family. Got to be socially distant. And people are dying alone. Why does the devil want people to die alone? So they can die in despair. And those who die in despair don't go to heaven. And you know many of these souls that are dying alone? It's not because of the coronavirus. It's not because they've locked the doors of the hospitals. Do you think God doesn't know how to get through the door of a hospital? I think he knows how to get through doors of hospitals. Many souls are dying now without the sacraments because they are Voltaire Jr. He said, I will destroy the Catholic Church. I will destroy that church, but when I'm dying, I'm going to call the priest. And he's going to come and anoint me, and I'll get the best of both worlds. My life will be spent with my fellow Masons and Satanists. I will live my life with them. And then when I die, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to call Padre. He's going to put oil on my eyeballs. He's going to put oil on my ears. He's going to put oil on my hands and my feet and my nose and my lips. And I'm going to be cured by anointing. He's going to dissolve me and I'm going to go to heaven. So my life working for Satan. Priest shows up. I get anointed when I die and I still go to heaven. I got it all planned out. What was the problem of Voltaire? He had the wrong friends, it turned out. He had the wrong neighbors, it turned out. And when he died, what happened? He had the wisdom of Queen Elizabeth, who sold her soul to Satan. And after 40 years and she was dying, one of her priests, Anglican priests, came. I'm here to anoint you. And she said, you're not a priest. She already knew about Apostolic Curie in advance. She had a gift of prophecy. She could read the encyclical of Leo XIII 400 years before he wrote it. The 1552 Ordinal made no priests. They were laymen. They were not priests. And so the Anglican priest came up to her. I'm going to give you Christ. I'm going to give you sacraments because he probably even still used Latin in those days. He hadn't fully switched over yet. You're no priest. Get out. I need a priest. That's what she said. And she screamed because she hated the priest. And she died in despair. And many souls are going to die in despair because they have hated the priest. They have hated God and they cut them off. But there are other souls who will be saved because they will turn to God in this crisis. And they, God will save them. Miracles still happen. Yesterday, I didn't know if I'm going to come to California this weekend. I'm going to cancel my trip to California. To Phoenix in California. What happened? Went ahead and came anyway. I said mass in multiple places on this trip to Phoenix and uh, up in the North California, Los Angeles area in the north of today, today down here, and also going around the region. Because the man called up, and I was deciding, you know what? Maybe I won't catch my flight tomorrow morning to Phoenix or to Tucson. And while I was deciding to do that, I got a phone call, an unknown number. Hi, my name is so-and-so, and I've been following your sermons on the Internet, etc., and I want to go to the Mass. Are you still going to California this weekend? Because I want to go to your Mass with my family. I said, well, I guess I better go. So I came. And then yesterday, another call. Someone very sick and not doing so well. Well, you know, you know, Father... I was, uh, sister, is asking, I asked our Lord 
Because I haven't received Holy Communion, and I haven't been able to go to church for a very long time due to my sickness. I haven't received the sacraments for months and months and months since last year, sometime last year. But I asked our Lord, can you please let me get a palm on Palm Sunday? Can I receive our Lord? Just so happened in passing through the area yesterday. Just so happened because of this foolish virus stupidity and keeping the Blessed Sacrament to bring the Holy Communion to souls. And so she got her Holy Communion and she got her palm last night. Now there are many souls, there are many souls who all thought they were going to have a nice Palm Sunday Mass, and yet many of our people knew they weren't going to get it. Because Father comes once every two or three, four, once a month, once every six weeks, three times a year. We can't go along with the modernism. But some little girl said, some little lady said, Lord, can you please get me a Palm on Palm Sunday? Can you please get me a Holy Communion on Palm Sunday? Because now all the churches are even closed. The priests aren't coming to help me. Just happened to be passing by. God knows how to arrange things. He will take care of those that love him. Somehow, he just knows how to do it. As a holy mother of God, do you know she had questions on that March 25th, 2020 years ago? She had a lot of questions. The angel Gabriel came to her and said, I want you to be the mother of God. You're marrying Joseph, a very stubborn guy, lives in the town of Nazareth, doesn't like moving, not a traveler. And I want you to be, except to be the mother of God. She knew that God didn't need to be born in Bethlehem, Nazareth, that, that, and then Joseph wouldn't move. She knew that all these prophecies had to happen, but she didn't understand how. She, the mother of God, Mary, the mother of God, conceived immaculate, with no fault of any kind, and more beautiful every moment from her conception until she was 15 years old. So beautiful that when the angel Gabriel came and looked at her, he saw the greatest of beauty that ever could be seen, something more beautiful than what he had used to be seen in heaven. And therefore he said, Ave Maria. Grazia plena. Hail Mary, full of grace. Last night, I meet a lady who's no longer in the Catholic faith. She was a Catholic. When she attended the ceremony, I'm going to give the palm and the, and the because of course the person taking care of is not really practicing the faith anymore. He says, "You know, Father, I'm not practicing the faith anymore, but I still believe in Jesus." Now watch my hands. People talk to me about the Hail Mary. And she told me this last night. Wash my hands. And I would say to the Protestants, you know what it says in the Bible of the Hail Mary? Look closely at my hands. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Hail Mary, full of grace. Because God is in her womb. And all grace comes from that womb. And she knows that. And hasn't been practicing the faith for many, many years. How many Catholics that are holy and go to Mass every Sunday and are approved? And everything is safe and everything is fine, but they don't know what it means to be filled with grace. To be a pregnant mother with a child who is heaven. Can God still work miracles when his religion has become illegal? Can he still get us through locked doors? I think every day of my beloved children in Canada. They don't want me to cross the border now. One man is very sick and maybe dying. What are we going to do? They will not be abandoned. There will be a way to receive Christ. Our government makes laws and they lock borders. 
Because after all, only essential things can cross into Canada now, and the United States, and Jesus Christ is not on the list. And who is taking him off the list? Was it the Bilderbergers? Was it the bad guys? No. It was a regular Catholic who had took Jesus Christ off the list a long time ago. And now it's just becoming public. So they're threatening to arrest, but they haven't done it yet. The mayor, the governor of Michigan, announced the other day, churches can remain open. But the Catholic bishops don't agree. You Masonic governor who worships Satan on the weekends, you think our churches should be open? What do you know? You're a Mason. We're Catholics. We know our churches should not be open. Now they're kind of right, because the Novosoto churches should be closed. But they should be closed to the Novosoto Mass. They should not be closed to Christ. They should be closed to the heresies of Vatican II. But that's not why they're closing them. Because the heresies are quite live outside those doors. And the heresies remain. They're not closing the doors because they're afraid of Vatican II. They're closing the doors because they're afraid of God and they're afraid of Christ and they want the whole world to know what is might as well be the truth. They don't really know, love, and serve God. They're not disciples of Christ. And some of them are good men like these 11 apostles on Holy Saturday, on the Saturday before Palm Sunday. They're good men. And they thought they knew, I've been with Christ three and a half years. That's a long time. Every day and every night for 24 hours a day being with God made man. That's got to be wonderful. And they were with him all the time. They saw so many things. They seen it all. Now here comes this girl who was a prostitute. Here comes this girl who just repented a few months ago or maybe a year ago at the most. And she comes in and she breaks alabaster oil on the feet. This is too much. Were they different from Simon the leper? Were they different from Simon the Pharisee? Simon the Pharisee was scandalized because a prostitute came in and wept upon his feet. And whereas Saint Simon, Saint Jude, his name was also Judas, Jude Thaddeus, the other Judas, who would become a great saint, a patron of the impossible, today his heart was impossible, his mind was impossible. He didn't understand the very God he lived with. To what purpose is this waste? It could have been sold and given to the poor. Judas is right. He's speaking, but he's saying what we're all thinking, Lord. I didn't know it was worth 300 denarii. That's pretty expensive. I thought it was worth maybe 10 denarii, maybe 50 denarii, maybe 100 denarii, but 300, wow. Pretty valuable stuff. Judas knows his stuff. That's worse than I thought. Judas is right. And imagine how Judas spoke with such emotion, with such conviction, with such love of the poor, with such sincerity. Who could question this man's goodness? And he was scandalized. And what happened afterwards? St. Matthew tells us in the Passion yesterday. And then Judas went to the chief priests. When did he go to the chief priests? Saturday. Before Palm Sunday. Now that's important to note because on Palm Sunday, Christ went into town and he was received with great glory. Maybe Judas would have said, you know what, maybe I did wrong yesterday when I sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. Maybe I shouldn't go through with this crucifixion because look at this, he's got the people to adore. Judas, you, you wanted me to have the people call me king? That was when we were in the desert. And you were scandalized, Judas, because I didn't let them make me king in the desert. Well, now I'm in the city of Jerusalem. I'm not in the desert. It's not just 5,000 people that I fed a few fishes. We're talking about several million people. More than two and a half million people are right here for the feast. And I'm letting them call me king. Judas, shouldn't you convert? Don't you see, Judas, how if I want to, I can make them all call me king? See the glory with which I'm being appraised today, Judas? Judas, I know you got 30 pieces of silver in your pocket. 
I know you sold me yesterday to the high priest. The others thought you went to give to the poor, like you so often do, when in fact you went to see the chief priest and to betray me. Look at Judas, the children are calling me the son of David. Judas, can't you repent? No. His heart was already given to Satan, and the miracle of Palm Sunday didn't fix it. And the miracle of raising of Lazarus didn't fix it. And the miracle of man born blind didn't fix it. And the great charity and wisdom of that heart of the most wonderful Mary Magdalene didn't fix it. He didn't get fixed at all. Palm Sunday didn't save Judas. You know what a wise man once said named Devez? He was a rich and wise man. He followed the laws of God. He just didn't take care of Lazarus. And he had charity in his heart because he thought about his brothers as he was burning in hell. And he said, Abraham, tell Lazarus to go to my brothers because they're living the same life I was living. They're living just like me. Have Lazarus go and tell them that they keep living like me. They're going to burn in hell also. And what did Abraham say? Divas they have Moses and the prophets. Just like you have Moses and the prophets. But if they see a miracle, if an angel appears to them, if Lazarus rises from the dead, they'll repent. You know, Divas, how many miracles did Judas see? Did he repent? How many miracles did Caiaphas see? Did he repent? Caiaphas lived past the resurrection. Judas didn't make it. Caiaphas lived past the resurrection. Did he repent? Caiaphas knew that Christ rose from the dead. Did he repent? No. He paid the soldiers off to tell more lies. That's what he did. Now is the time, not of repentance, but the time of the test. Where does your heart stand? Where does your soul stand? Can God still do miracles? Oh, yes, he can. A little girl wanted a palm yesterday. She got it. How many hundreds of thousands and millions of Catholics in the United States wanted a palm yesterday? And they wanted a palm, but they had nothing to worry about three weeks ago. They could go to a church anywhere and get a palm. This girl could not travel out of her heart, her apartment. But she got a palm. She got a Holy Communion. God will make sure they were taken care of. Do we have faith? And is it really that bad if we don't get a Paul? Is it really that bad if we don't receive Holy Communion? It isn't bad at all if Christ is in our hearts. Pray to Joan of Arc. She was a great saint. For our times, a wonderful maid, Joan, such a wonderful maid, she had to give up Mass. She had to give up Holy Communion in order to be a saint. What has she got for it? She sees God face to face. She possesses Him in her whole being right now. And she will never lose Him. She never learned how to read. She was never educated, but she knew, I cannot lie to go to Mass. I cannot lie to receive Holy Communion. I cannot lie and possess God for all eternity. Therefore, I'll have to say the truth, and let, let the truth keep me away from Mass, which it did. Let the truth keep me away from the sacraments, which it did. And look at all those priests. It was priests and bishops that condemned her. And those priests and those bishops, where are they now? Do they see God? Unless they repented, the answer is no. They burn. One of my superiors several years ago, as you know, obedience is so important. Because, you know, one day in the life of St. Louis de Montfort, 
he built a Calvary in France. He built a big Calvary. It was a flat land. It was the middle of the, it was, it was his preaching and mission. And the place was flatter than a cake. And he said, we must build a Calvary, but there's no hill here. Calvary was a hill. Let's make a hill. And so he told all the people of the mission, grab buckets and grab shovels and let's make a hill. And they, old men, 80 years old, they grabbed buckets and they grabbed shovels and they all picked up dirt and they made this Mount Calvary out of nothing. And after they're working all day, they realize, wait a minute, there's Grandpa with a cane like that. And he's carrying a big bucket. And there's a little bitty girl, four years old, carrying a bucket. And there's a boy, five years old, carrying a bucket. And he says, you know what? It took them all day. They, wait, wait a minute. Is anybody tired? No, we're not tired. Anybody's muscles hurt? No. We're not tired. No. The muscles aren't hurt. We just made a mountain in the middle of France. And then they put a cross on top of it. No one got tired. And my superior told me, do you know what happened to that mountain? It's in the life of St. Louis de Montfort. The bishop made it get tore down. You can't visit that mountain. Why can you not visit the miraculous mountain? Because the Catholic bishop made him tear it down. You know what he said? Men who were enemies of Louis de Montfort said, he made a mountain. You know what that mountain is? It's actually a pile of dirt to cover arms and ammunition for the English so they can come over and take over France. Oh, we can't have that. The bishop, well, maybe there's not arms in there, but you know what? He did build a mountain without asking permission from the bishop. He was disobedient. So my superior told me several years ago, you see that? Louis de Montfort had to tear down the mountain. Because he, a saint, was disobedient to his bishop. So I gave a simple response. I said, okay, which one's a saint and which one's in hell? Hmm. We'll go with the saint. Hmm. You stick with the bishop. Hmm. Which one's a saint and which one's in hell? Hmm. That bishop's in hell. Hmm. But he recognized his authority. And Lewis is in heaven. Now the fact is, this is a time that is not a test of obedience to superiors. It's a time of a test of love of God. Do we love him or not? We can have all kinds of fears. Don't be afraid of the virus. The virus is nothing. Most who get it, if they do get it, it's like a common cold. Those that die, just because they happen to be 85 years old, and have 10,000 other diseases, which they're going to die from anyway. And by the way, if you're healthy, I hate to break it to you, but uh, you're going to die. <laughs> and if you're not healthy, uh, you're going to die. <laughs> and if you can't decide whether you're healthy or not, okay, you're going to die. <laughs> so why live for health? There's got to be some kind of health that lasts past death, and that's the health of the knowledge and love of God in my heart. Now these foolish, foolish disciples, they were scandalized. Not just Judas. Boy, this is a real waste. But you know what? The twelve of them didn't understand. Let's know this about understanding. God, it's not important that we understand. Twelve of them didn't understand. Twelve of them were angry. Twelve of them agreed with Judas. At least eleven out of the twelve. St. John maybe held judgment. He was a pure apostle. I understand where Judas is coming from. And I understand the thought of the other apostles. But I don't know. I think it was kind of beautiful what Mary Magdalene did. I kind of think it was wonderful. I don't know what he's saying about his death. Because I don't see how Jesus can die. But at the same time, it's something beautiful happening there. I think that... There was something wonderful in the heart of Mary Magdalene. I don't understand why she did it. But I don't know. I can't answer Judas. I can't answer the other apostles. But maybe it was something. I feel like something wonderful happened. I'm kind of happy that Mary poured that oil over his feet. It does smell like it's worth about 30,000 bucks. It smells pretty nice. He didn't understand either. The beloved disciple. And they were all upset, and they didn't understand. But you know what? Twelve did not understand, but one thought it might be something wonderful. 
Twelve didn't understand, but ten thought, I don't understand, but my Lord knows best. Judas makes sense, and I agree with him, but I don't know. I think I'll go with the Lord. He said it's for his burial, and he has to be buried sometime, I suppose. And that everywhere in the world we're going to go, we're going to tell the story about this alabaster. So let me get that back. Remember the smell. He says wherever we go throughout the world, we're going to tell the story in honor of her. St. Augustine did a great devotion to her. He said, Mary Magdalene, our Lord said, she shall be honored. Who else did he say that about? His holy mother, of course. He didn't even say that about St. John. He didn't even say that about St. Peter. But he said, this girl, this Mary Magdalene, she shall be honored. Maybe she's important. And Augustine says about her, who is this Mary Magdalene? We can only say of her that she is first. She is first and she is first. She's a first in need health. She didn't need money. She didn't care about those things. She was immersed in sin. But she saw that this man came not to give us money, not to give us health. He came to wipe away sin. And how do you wipe away sin? You have sorrow for your sin and you love him. The twelve apostles couldn't figure that out. They were too busy studying their books. But she was the first one to understand that. And as a prostitute, she went straight to the house of Simon, the Pharisee. She went straight to the feet of Christ, and she wept. And she poured her tears upon his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And she was the first to understand his coming. And St. Augustine continues, she was the first to understand who he is. On Holy Thursday night, he would say to the apostles, I am the truth. She knew before that. She sat at his feet and she listened to him. She didn't care what he was saying. Whatever he's saying, they can write it down in their books. She just says it to him. He says many true things. In fact, everything he says is true. But I want to love him because he is truth. And he would tell Pilate that he was the truth. And he would tell his apostles that he is the truth. He is the truth. He's truth living. He's truth itself. And she understood. And her heart was going to give him ointments when he died. But she couldn't anoint him when he died. She tried. Remember when our Lord died? She wanted to anoint him, but she could not. And she carried myrrhs and aloes to the tomb, but she wasn't able to apply them. And somehow she had understanding, you know, when he dies, I may not be able to anoint him. When he dies, I may not be able to be there. So I think I'll take care of it now. And she grabbed her most expensive alabaster oil worth 30,000 bucks, two-thirds of a year's wages. And she brought it, and she broke it upon his feet, and her heart made her understand that he's going to die soon. And she's the first to understand that he was going to die, and she poured out her best upon him. This is the time of charity. Right now, people are storing up their money, getting ready, storing up their food. This is the time to give to the church. This is the time to give to the poor. This is the time to empty the cupboards. This is not the time to hoard things in. And you know what? She understood that. And now, 2,020 years later, minus 33, so it was 1,900, whatever, 67, 87 years later. What's happening? We're speaking with Mary Magdalene on the day that she wasted oil on the feet of our Lord. How much money was it worth? How much charity has gone out to save souls and save the sick and save the poor and save the church for 2,000 years? Oh, hell of a lot more than 300 denarii. And those who know the 300 denarii, they're the ones they are going to be a whole time in hell. Judas is there waiting. 
You can do your bean counting with him. You can check your prices. Don't forget to check the inflation rate. The economy is collapsing. Now is the time to go about doing good. Not tomorrow, not the next day, not next month, not next year. Now is the time. The most sacred time. Now we got to go visit house to house. I always knew this time would come. Didn't think it would come so quickly. But we go house to house and bring Holy Communion. Go house to house and bring confession. And those who want to receive our Lord, who want to be visited in this time of crisis, call on the Mount Carmel. Call 303-549-3047. 602-469-4469. The other numbers available on the website there, and we'll find a way somehow to bring you Christ, somehow to bring a confession, and maybe a poem, and maybe a blessing. Those that want Christ, they shall receive him. God will take care of us. And if we have to not have a poem for a few years, and not have a Holy Communion for a few years, and not have a Mass for a few years, that's fine. Keep the Mass in your heart. Keep the palms in your heart. And God will take care of us, and He'll never ever let us be abandoned. There's still miracles in 2020, and there will be miracles until the end of time. Let us have faith and confidence in God. And He will make sure that His will is accomplished. And as He said those beautiful words in the sacred scripture we read earlier today, earlier this week, it's actually on Saturday before Palm Sunday, he said, where I am, there also my minister will be. Where does God go? Many strange places. But where he is, his minister will be. And the minister of God will go to many places where maybe Christ is not. But where Christ is, he shall be. When he needs to be there, and it is arranged so many times, even so many of his experiences on our lives of the priesthood happens all the time. Plane is canceled, something goes wrong, car breaks down, something happens. Now, something's going to happen. Something's going to happen. And God will take care of those. Normally next week I would go to Australia. Normally next week I would go to the Philippines. Won't be able to do that right now. But they'll be taken care of. We'll go to Canada also. God will take care of them. And we cannot be cut apart forever won't be that way. This is not the time of the victory of Satan. This is not the time of the Antichrist. This is the time just before the victory of Mary. When you see these things happen, lift up your head, says our Lord, because your redemption is nigh. So who has eyes to see, who has ears to hear, lift up your head, because your redemption is very nigh indeed. Behold, it is at the doors. For Mary Magdalene weeps so terribly in just a few days. But then she shall say, Rabboni. And her joy she still has 2,000 years later. And 10,000 years from now, she shall still have the joy of that Rabboni. All the way until the ending of the universe, which shall never end and forever. For sorrow she had between Holy Thursday night and Easter Sunday morning. For about 36 hours. Her joy is forever and ever and ever. And so it's not such a sad thing to be a few days before a crucifixion that is very brief and a few days before a, a resurrection that is forever. Can we go to the closing? Let's go all.